Salvation. Is it by the grace of God or is it by obedience? Is it by one or the other? Or is it the case that both grace and obedience work together in our salvation to, to bring about salvation from sin? That's a very important question because there are many in the religious world today who believe that we are saved by the grace of God, which is exactly what the Bible teaches. But many believe that we are saved by grace alone. And the suggestion is, from that idea, is that we do not have to do anything in order to bring about our own salvation. That since it is by grace, then God takes care of it, and we don't have to do anything, uh, anything further. But we need to know what the Bible teaches. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, Peter writes in 2 Peter 3 and verse 15, 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh your reason of the hope that is in you. So, let's think about this as we go along in our study. First of all, the Bible does emphatically teach that we are saved by the grace of God. Now, think about this for a moment. When we think about grace, the, the very simple definition of grace is loving kindness or goodwill. Okay, now if you take just that simple definition, then we, we understand that there are many things that are made possible because of God's grace, because of His goodwill. Uh, the sunshine, the rain, the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, all of that is made possible because of God's loving kindness. But the Bible teaches that the greatest gift of God's grace is salvation from sin. Now, when we speak of salvation from sin and, and how the grace of God makes that possible, when we tie grace in with that greatest gift, the grace of God then has to do with God's unmerited favor, which is extended toward mankind. Someone may ask, well, what does unmerited favor mean? That simply means the favor of God, which is extended toward man, which is undeserved on our part. That also means that there's absolutely nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. And uh, we'll also talk about the fact that grace is a gift of God. But we need to understand that grace is God's unmerited favor extended toward man. Now, look at what Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, when you take those two verses of Scripture individually and you just take it part by part, there are many lessons that can be learned from this. By grace are you saved. If you're saved at all, it will be by the grace of God. There's, again, there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. So if we're saved at all, it will be by the grace of God. But this verse also teaches, verse 8, teaches that man has a responsibility to respond to the grace of God. That's where faith comes in. For by grace are you saved through faith. Now, in a few moments, we'll talk about exactly what that means. But by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's not anything that we can do to earn it, he says it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, having looked at those two verses of Scripture, think about what the Lord says in Luke 17 and verse 10. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you say, we are unprofitable servants, 
we have done that which was our duty to do. So when you look at the Lord's words there, He's simply pointing out that when we have done everything humanly possible to live up to the teachings of God's Word, then we have still done nothing whereby we can boast. We have done nothing by way of earning any of God's blessings. We have only done what we're supposed to do. We have only done what we ought to do. Note, if you will, that Paul also writes in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now, you go back to Ephesians 8 and 9, and you put that together with Romans 3 and verse 20. We cannot be saved by works of merit, that is, works that we might do to, to uh, claim that God owes us salvation. But then again, nor are we saved by the works of the law. Paul makes that clear in Romans 3 and verse 20. But you look at a few more verses in Romans chapter 3, and in verses 9, 10, and 23, Paul points out the common problem that all of mankind has and has had since virtually the beginning of time. In Romans 3 and verse 9, Paul says that both Jew and Gentile are under sin. That is, we both stand under the condemnation of sin. In verse 10, he says there is none righteous. No, not one. Go back to the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 64, the prophet says all our righteousness are as filthy rags. So when we see the prophet's statement, and we look at Paul's statement, when he says there's none righteous, we understand what he's talking about. We cannot be saved by our own works of righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul says that God made Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. All right. Now, in verse 23, Paul says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I've mentioned those verses of Scripture for one reason. And that is to show again and to reemphasize the need for the grace of God. Jew and Gentile stand under the condemnation of sin. There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. There's nothing, no amount of works that we may do whereby we can boast of our salvation. And so then we need the grace of God. It is a gift. And that's what Paul writes plainly in Ephesians 2 in verse 8. It is the gift of God, he says. But I want you to think about this for a moment. If you were to give a gift or to offer a gift to an individual, must that individual accept that gift? Well, I think all of us know the answer to that question. They do not have to accept it. But then again, when it comes to offering a gift, uh, there may be nothing that we would require for that person to do to earn that gift. But at the same time, we may stipulate that there are some conditions that they have to meet in order to receive that gift. And so if I'm going to give someone a gift, I may have one condition, I may have several. And I may state to them, I will give you this gift if you will meet those conditions. Now, having met the conditions, then they can receive the gift. But the point I'm making is, since the grace of God is a gift, it can either be accepted or it can be rejected. And if there are conditions associated with the grace of God, if an individual rejects those conditions, then he's rejecting the gift. So, you put all of this together then, and there's no doubt at all that salvation is by the grace of God. If we're saved at all, it will be by God's grace. Now, what about <coughs> obedience? Where does that come in exactly? And if an individual obeys the Lord, then what has he done? Has he done anything to, to, uh, to earn God's grace? Has He done anything to earn His, his um, salvation? 
if he simply obeys? Let's see what the scriptures have to say about it. There are works that God has given for man to do. God devised works. Most of the time, I think, when those in the religious world, will, when they argue that, uh, that we're saved by faith and not by works, many fail to realize that faith itself is actually a work. In John chapter 6 and verse 29, Jesus said, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So faith itself is a work. Now here's the question. Is it a work that man has devised? Is it a, a work that, that man has come up with? You might ask the same question regarding any other thing that could be classified as a work. What about baptism? Is baptism a work? I don't think there's any doubt that it would fall under that category. But the question is, is it a work of man? Is it something that man has devised? Or is it something that God has devised for man to do? One interesting thing that we read about John the Baptist and his work during his time here on the earth is uh, in his work as a forerunner to Christ is that the Bible says that many of the, the Jews uh, would not be baptized of him and in so doing they rejected the counsel of God. That's interesting, isn't it? They rejected the counsel of God being not baptized of John. That tells us at least a couple of things. One is John's baptism was not a work that he came up with. It was something that he was appointed to do. And that appointment did not come by any other man. But it came from God Himself. And so if the Jews chose not to be baptized by John and in so doing rejected the counsel of God, well, that tells us that John's baptism was part of the counsel of God. It was a work that God had devised for men to do in obedience. All right. Now, the scriptures over and over again emphasize obedience to God. Now, keep in mind now that even when we obey, we haven't earned anything, but the scriptures do emphatically point out that God expects man to be obedient. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, the writer says that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation, listen to it, unto all them that obey him. Is Jesus then the Savior of all men? Is He going to save everyone? Not according to the inspired writer. Jesus Christ will save only those who obey Him. We also read in Matthew 7 and verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Jesus said, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And along those same lines in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Jesus asked some, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? To refer to Jesus as Lord was to refer to him as Master. And so the implication is, you refer to me as, as Lord, as Master, but you're not willing to do what I say. You're not willing to obey me. So again, Matthew 7, 21, we must do the will of God. In Revelation 22, 14, if you thought about the fact that, that the Bible opens up with the emphasis upon obedience, and it closes with the emphasis on obedience, and all the way through, there are so many, many, many different passages of of scripture which emphasize obedience to God. In Genesis chapter 2, God told Adam, of every tree in the garden you're free to eat except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, do you think based upon what the Lord, what God said to Adam that he expected Adam to obey? Absolutely. You can eat of every tree in the garden except this one. You do not eat of this tree. 
Well, then you go all the way over to Revelation 22 and 14. And John says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and they enter in through the gates into the city. Who has right to the tree of life? Those who do his commandments. All right. So the Bible makes it abundantly clear then that salvation comes by obedience as well as the grace of God. And here's what we're going to do now in the remaining moments of our study. We're going to tie the two together. Grace and obedience. We're going to see how they work together and how that they will not save man if one of them stands alone. If grace stands alone minus obedience. All right, examples of salvation by grace and obedience. First of all, you have Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, in verse 8, this is what Moses said about Noah. He said that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, would anyone argue then that God's grace was not with Noah? I don't think so. Not when you look at that verse and when you think about how plain and how simple it is. Noah was justified by the grace of God. God's grace was with him. But then you go all the way down to the end of the chapter, verse 22, and this is what it says. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now, in between there, this is what you've got. Noah, God told Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. I'm going to destroy the earth with every living thing upon the face of the earth by a way of a flood. God told Noah what to do in order for him and his family to be spared from the global destruction. He told him to build an ark. Told him what kind of wood to use and what the different specifications were. How wide, how long, how high, how many stories, how many doors, how many windows. He told him what to use on the outside and the inside to make sure that the ark was sealed to keep all of the water out. He was to use pitch within and pitch without as well. He gave him the exact specifications for building the ark. For over a hundred years, no one worked on that ark. Just suppose, even though Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, just suppose that Noah's decision was not to build the ark. Just suppose his thinking was that surely God can save me by any other means besides an ark. And so just suppose he didn't build it. Would anyone argue that Noah and his family would have been spared from the flood? Absolutely not. He had to obey God. Here's how the two work together. It was by being obedient that Noah was saved by the grace of God. That was how he accessed the grace of God. Look at Jericho. And we'll read about it in Joshua chapter 6. In Joshua chapter 6, about verses 2 and 3, listen to what God said to Joshua. He said, listen, I have given Jericho into your hand. I have given you the city. But then God goes on to tell Joshua what he needs to do and what the Israelites need to do for them to be able to capture the city. He told them to march around the city, compass the city about one time a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, go around seven times, and then the priests were to blow the ram's horns, and then when the nation heard the ram's horns blow, Everybody was to, to let out a great shout. And when they did that, the walls would fall. And those walls were so enormous that it was said that the walls that were built back during that, that period of time, a chariot, at least one chariot, could sit on the top of the wall and you could go all around, all around the city in that chariot on the wall. It's how thick and enormous those walls were. But here's the point I'm making. There's no doubt at all that the city of Jericho was given to Joshua and the Israelites by the grace of God. There's no doubt about that. 
But did God also require them to do what he said in order for them to receive the city? In order for them to be able to capture the city? Absolutely. And if they had chosen not to obey God, then they would not have received the city. What about those on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Were they saved by the grace of God? Well, there's no doubt about it. They asked the question in, in Acts 2 and verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ, for the remission of sins. Now listen to this. Over in Titus 2, 11 and 12, listen to what the Bible says there. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, instructing us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. One of the things that the grace of God does is instructs us. Now, how did the people learn the gospel on Pentecost? They were instructed. They were taught. And so the preaching of the gospel on Pentecost was, a manif was one of the manifestations of the grace of God. But when Peter told them in verse 38 what to do, were they required to do it? Absolutely. And if they had not done it, then they would not have been saved. Now, think about the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Philip joined himself to the chariot of the eunuch. They're studying Isaiah chapter 53 about Christ. They come to a certain body of water, and the eunuch says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now remember again from Titus 2, the grace of God instructs. And that's exactly what Philip was doing when he was riding along in the chariot with the eunuch. He was instructing him. And so what the eunuch learned was made possible by the grace of God. But they come to the water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, did Philip reply, you don't really have to do anything. Uh, the grace of God will take care of that. No, he didn't say that. He said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. Believe what? Believe what they had been talking about. Believe what they had been studying from Isaiah 53 about the Messiah. And so the eunuch said, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then they commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So, by the way, when they came up out of the water, is when the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Not before, but after. After he had obeyed the gospel of Christ. And so salvation then was made possible by God's grace, but the eunuch had to do what he was instructed to do. By the way, how did, why, did the, uh, why did the eunuch ask about baptism? Because you don't read anything in the context there about Philip saying anything about baptism. But it does say that from Isaiah 53, he started at that scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, raised again. And according to Paul in Romans 6, 3 through 6, Baptism into Christ is a likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's why he asked about it. And then finally, Saul of Tarsus. You read about his confrontation with the Lord in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. And the Lord tells Saul, go into the city and it will be told you what you need to do. Now, I don't think anyone would, would argue that Saul's salvation was not made possible by the grace of God. But Jesus told him, go and it will be told you what you need to do. In other words, go into the city and there will be someone there who will teach you what you need to do. And so he was led by the hand into the city and was there. He was met by Ananias. And Ananias told him in Acts 22 and 16, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. What if Saul had said, no, I don't want to do that. 
he wouldn't have been saved. His salvation was made possible by the grace of God, but he had to do what he was instructed to do. And so what about us today? How do we access the grace of God? Listen to this. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10, listen to it now. Paul tells Timothy, you need to be strong in the grace, listen, that is in Christ Jesus. The only way to access the grace of God is to be in that place where God is located. And that is in Christ. And the Bible says, it teaches, that there's only one action which is said to place one into Christ. Now, it's necessary to believe. It's necessary to repent. It's necessary to confess your faith. But then, according to Paul in Galatians 3.27, in Romans 6 and 3, you're baptized into Christ. And once you're baptized into Him, then you are in Him where all spiritual blessings are located and where you've accessed the grace of God. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to obey the gospel. Our Savior said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. If you fall on away and your need is to return to your first love, and we encourage you to do that as together we stand and sing.